we talked about how the standard model had a fundamental symmetry called CPT that came from the special relativity on which the standard model is built. Then we've looked at some of the components of that symmetry. We looked at charge conjugation, the C, and the parity, P, and found that the weak interaction maximally broke those. And even when we combine them together to look at the CP symmetry, which is the symmetry between matter and antimatter, we found that the weak force slightly broke that. About one in a thousand kaon decays seemed to break this CP symmetry. Now, interestingly, the standard model has a way to account for that CP violation. And that is perhaps one of the most interesting bits of physics in the standard model, because it's the only physics we know that requires three generations of quarks. And CP violation is in fact very important because it's a symmetry between matter and antimatter. It's one of the three Sakharov conditions on the Big Bang to explain why the universe is full of matter. Uh, the other two conditions being you need to have a thermodynamic disequilibrium and you need to have baryon number violation. So given that the standard model can potentially explain CP violation, let's see how we can put that into the standard model. So here is how the standard model explains CP violation. Um, and before you panic, you already know this matrix. This matrix here is just the CKM matrix, which describes the mixing between the weak and strong eigenstates for quarks, right? So it explains how the weak um, eigenstates for quarks are not the same as the strong flavor eigenstates. And at the time we were discussing this, uh, we said that there were three um, angles uh, that it could be you could be expressed as, as three angles, three free parameters, and one complex phase. And so these are the three angles here, uh, theta 1, 2, theta 1, 3, and theta 2, 3. Um, and you end up with this horrendous looking expression, which, you know, is using shorthand, uh, because otherwise it would look even bigger if I had to write out all the sines and cosines. Now, you do not need to remember this at all. The important part to take away are these complex phases, right? This e to the i delta, because it's this complex phase that is what gives us CP violation in the standard model. If there was no complex phase, then we would not have any CP violation. And the interesting thing is, is that the CKM matrix is a three by three uh, unitary matrix. And so it is the smallest uh, unitary matrix that requires a complex phase. If you have a two by two unitary matrix, uh, you just have a single mixing angle um, and no complex phase. The three by three is the first one that requires a, a complex phase. If you go to four by four, you just get more complex phases and more mixing angles. You don't get anything new. Uh, so three by three is the only one, uh, is the smallest one that gives us this um, complex phase. And what that means is, is that in order to get CP violation in um, a process, you need to involve all three generations of quarks. So let's see how we can do that first for what's called indirect CP violation. So indirect CP violation is when the CP violation occurs in the mixing between the K0 and the K0 bar. And in the standard model, there are two uh, leading order diagrams that contribute to it, these two box processes. And both of these diagrams involve all three generations of quark and that is what is required in order for this complex phase to get involved. If you only have two uh, uh, generations involved, then the complex phase can be uh, rotated out, or one can definitely be got rid of. But if you have all three, you cannot get rid of this complex phase. And so that's what you need to see in a diagram for it to contribute to CP violation. So if we look at these two, we're going to get CP violation when we mix between k-ons and anti-k-ons. So what does that mean for the states? 
Well, if you remember, we had the CP of this K1 state that was a mixture of K0, K0 bar, and that had a CP of plus 1. And then we had the CP of this K2 state, and that had a CP of minus 1. And we said that this state is the one that goes to 2 pions, and this state is the one that has to go to 3 pions in order to conserve CP. So if you violate CP in the mixing, what it means is we need to construct two more states. The short-lived state that we call Ks and the long-lived state that we call Kl. And these states are not CP eigenstates. They are the mass eigenstates. These are the states that propagate through space. Right, so a Ks is, will be a physical uh, uh, particle that propagates through space, and it is mainly the Cp plus 1, because it mainly decays to two pions, but it has a little bit of the uh, uh, K2 state, which decays to three pions. And similarly, the long-lived state is mainly the K2 state that decays to two pions, but it's a little, uh, sorry, the K2 state that decays to three pions, but it's a little bit of the K1 state that decays to two pions, and this is what Christian Cronin, Fitch and Turley saw, uh, and they won the Nobel Prize for, because this is the bit that violates CP. In other words, the long-lived state is no longer a pure CP eigenstate, it's a mixture of the two, and because it's this mixture, you've now violated CP, um, because this you know, K1 state, uh, some part of the K1 state is living longer than it should, and some part of the K2 state is living, you know, is decaying more rapidly than it should. So that's how we account for it in the mixing with these two diagrams here. But next, we need to look at what's called direct CP violation. And this decay happens about one in a thousand uh, decays uh, will decay to two pions for the K long short, uh, from the K long uh, um, particle. Direct CP violation um, is when we have a CP um, minus one state decaying into a CP plus one state. In other words, the decay mechanism itself violates CP. So these are the diagrams for K0 going to charged pions, the similar ones for uh, K0 bar going to charged pions, and also K0 and K0 bar going to neutral pions. But uh, we'll just uh, look at these diagrams first of all. Now, if we look at these, di these diagrams are both uh, leading order, but this diagram only involves a single generation of quark. There's no um, interference between all three uh, quark uh, generations, so this cannot contribute to uh, CP violation, right? So there's no CP violation from this diagram. This type of diagram that's called a penguin diagram um, because John Ellis lost a bet, uh, well, or sorry, rather won a bet uh, to uh, uh, get the word penguin into a conference talk he was giving when he was a postdoc. Um, so these were now named penguin diagrams. And you can see here that they have all three generations of quark on this line and this line. And so here we get CP violation. So we're going to get CP violation in the decay from this diagram, but not from the other uh, diagram. So it's obviously going to be a weaker effect than it was in the mixing, where both leading order diagrams contributed to CP violation. So to get at this, um, what we use is that, of course, you've got to separate out the CP violation from the mixing from the CP violation that occurs in the decay. Because remember here, we're actually going from a, you know, for example, a CP um, uh, minus one state is decaying into a CP plus one state. So this would be our, you know, K2 uh, state um, decaying into uh, two pions, for example. So to get at that, what we use is we use this double ratio here, which is in fact, makes this measurement possible because it allows you to cancel out a huge number of systematic errors uh, from your experiment. So it means that um, you end up with very small errors um, in the end, which makes the uh, um, measurement possible. So the way it works is you use this ratio of K long to K short. 
that takes account of the um, mixing, the CP violation from mixing. The ratio of the neutral pion to the charged pion is because these two decay diagrams are going to be slightly different, you're going to get slightly different amounts of CP violation here, and this is showing you the CP violation that's coming from the decay rather than the mixing. And so we've got epsilon, which is the one that comes from the mixing, and then we have this new parameter, epsilon prime, which is the measure of the direct CP violation. And so if you measure this parameter epsilon prime, if it's not zero, then you've got direct CP violation, and that would be consistent with the standard model prediction. But it would then rule out the super weak interaction because the super weak interaction only applies to mixing, not to the decay. Now, having shown that we might be able to explain CP violation in the standard model, Two teams of experimenters, one at CERN and one at Fermilab, set out to prove that the CP violation we saw was at least consistent with the standard model predictions. And they did that by searching for direct CP violation, since if that existed, at least the super weak model, um, which has no direct CP violation, would be ruled out. Now this was an incredibly difficult experiment uh, to perform and the results of the first generation of experiments, NA31 at CERN and E731 at Fermilab, were unfortunately inconclusive. NA31 showed a 3 sigma direct CP violation effect and E731 showed a result that was consistent with zero direct CP violation. So a second generation of even more accurate experiments were constructed, NA48 at CERN and KTEV at Fermilab. And so let's have a look at how the NA48 experiment worked at CERN, since that was an experiment I worked on. So here's a nice simple diagram of the uh, NA48, the upper stages of the NA48 beamline. So this was the main target for NA48, Protons smashed into that target and produced showers of things that went down the, the beam line. Um, but these here are magnets. Um, and so this magnet here swept all the charged particles out of the way. And what was left was basically kaons, neutrons, and photons. Um, and there are other neutral particles, but they decay pretty rapidly. Um, neutrons and photons, of course, don't decay at all and just went down the beam line and went into the beam dump at the other side of the detector and didn't worry about those at all. And the kaons were the ones uh, that you were left with. Now, in order to look at both k-long and k-short, this target here was where the k-longs were produced. And that's because these are long-lived kaons, so they can travel a lot further before they decay. But you also need to produce k-shorts, so short-lived kaons. Now, the way this worked is that the protons, only about half the protons in the beam interacted in this target. It was a beryllium target. And those were also bent by the bending magnet. And they were sent down the beam line to this k-short target. But this guy here was a very innovative and uh, new uh, use of uh, a way to bend particles and also to reduce the intensity because you don't want too many particles hitting this target because you will see pretty much all the k short that are produced because they decay rapidly whereas you only see a small fraction of the k long that are produced because not all of them will decay before passing through the detector now you couldn't put a magnet here to bend the protons parallel to the beam line because otherwise you just undo all of your sweeping that this magnet provided so instead, what, the, uh, uh, what we used was a silicon crystal that was bent, and the lattice, the bent lattice of the silicon crystal deflected the protons around so that they were parallel to the beam. And, of course, all the other charged particles, because they were going anywhere, you, you know, would, would not get bent. You have to, in order to bend these particles, you have to have them well aligned with the crystal lattice. And even then, uh, you lose about two to three orders of magnitude and in intensity, right? No, only a small fraction of the protons, even when they're carefully aligned, um, actually go through the, the crystal. Although, in fact, more than we needed, we actually had to defocus the beam to reduce the number that went down.
Then we had this guy here that timed when a proton was coming down this line so that we knew exactly when a proton was hitting the target so we knew that whether we were looking at a K-short or a K-long decay. And then the protons were bent back along, sent uh, uh, along here, bent off and hit this K-short target that was very close to the decay region. And then this region here was where you looked at both the decays of the K-long and the K-short. Now this was the um, carrying on the beam line, so this was, you know, we, the, the stuff we saw before went up to here. Um, and this is showing the huge decay tank, the vacuum tank, where the K-ons came. So this was the K-long, this was the K-short. They came in here and they decayed into um, whatever number of pions uh, the decay involved. Now these counters here are called, were called the anti-counters. You need these because if you have a, a k-on decaying here and it decays into uh, three pions, right? So let's say we get a pion here, a pion here, and a pion here. Then if you only see two of the pions um, because the third one has, has escaped, uh, then you might think that this is a two pion decay and then of course your measurement's going to be wrong. So these counters uh, detected if anything was leaving uh, the decay region and then you could throw away the event and say, no, we're not seeing the full event. And then this was followed by a uh, magnet. So we had a spectrometer magnet here and wire chambers. So these would essentially measure the track of a charged particle, wouldn't do anything for photons, of course. And then they'd get bent and we'd measure the track this side. Um, depending on how much it was bent and in what direction it was bent, you could measure the momentum of the particle. Um, then we had uh, what was called the hodoscope here. This gave us the timing for charged particles as they came through here. And then we had an electromagnetic calorimeter, that was this thing, and a hadronic calorimeter. And uh, the particle would go in here and produce showers. And depending on how much uh, energy was left either here or here, you could identify it as either a photon. Well, there wouldn't be a track if it was a photon. But um, so if you just got nothing and then uh, a shower here, then that would be a photon. Um, or you could have uh, a hadronic energy here if it punched through into the back then you'd know it was a, a charged pion. And then we had uh, here, we had the bit that actually I worked on. These were muon veto counters. And that's because you can get the decay. K long uh, goes to um, uh, mu plus uh, pi minus uh, nu uh, mu um, or you know, mu minus pi plus nu mu bar. Um, and we didn't want these decays, right? These were not relevant for, for, for measuring CP violation. So if we had a charged particle uh, that made it through and went through these uh, uh, muon counters, then we could throw the uh, event away. So to see what it looked like in real life, here is a picture of the beam line. Um, so here is the blue vacuum tank. It got a bit of dust over, over the time. And these guys here, so these things here, are the anti-counters that you can see um, along the beam line that were spotting the missing pions. The beam pipe also goes a long way this way, right? It goes a long way behind the camera where you can't see it. And over here, you can just sort of see the, uh, these are the wire chambers. And then there was an electronics rack on top. And underneath the electronics rack here were the uh, calorimeters that measured the energy. But this was an enormously long uh, beam line, um, an enormously long decay tank that was uh, you know, a couple of meters in diameter and complete vacuum, which also made it a bit of a safety hazard because if you have a vacuum that's this large, you've got an awful lot of uh, stored energy in it. Um, and so they actually had a, um, you know, there were a lot of safety concerns at this end to make sure there were uh, things to stop, uh, stop the vacuum um, going out into the uh, hall and, and sucking things in from the hall um, if, uh, if something went wrong. So that was NA48. Now, NA48 uh, was running at the same time as the KTEV experiment at Fermilab. KTEV used a slightly different approach uh, to get a K-short component using a phenomenon called regeneration that in some ways was better and in some ways worse than, than NA48. But it's always good to have different experimental approaches because you get different errors. 
the result, the combined result uh, from both experiments for this epsilon prime over epsilon was this measurement here. And the fact that uh, now in the second generation of experiments this error was clearly way far more than phi sigma above zero meant that direct CP violation existed and happened in the Kaon system and that ruled out the superweak interaction and showed a result that was uh, consistent uh, with the standard model, although the calculations to come up with an exact number from the standard model uh, Feynman diagram was incredibly difficult. Um, but basically there was experimental proof that was consistent as far as we could calculate with the standard model um, and evidence that the CKM matrix had a complex phase. So with the discovery of direct CP violation, it looked like the complex phase of the CKM matrix really was the explanation for how uh, CP violation came about. However, to get more evidence and more proof of this, researchers switched from looking at k-ons to looking at a different meson system, and that is the neutral B mesons, B0 mesons. Like k-ons, these oscillate, but unlike k-ons, you can't nicely separate the two CP eigenstates by looking at long-lived and short-lived states. Instead, a different approach was used using asymmetric colliders and what's called a unitarity triangle that you can construct from the CKM matrix. So let's see how that works. So when it comes to looking at CP violation in the B meson system, we do things slightly differently. In, because we don't have these nice long and short-lived states that can separate things out, instead we have to look at uh, what are called unitarity triangles. And these come about because if you remember, uh, the CKM matrix is a unitary uh, uh, matrix. And a unitary matrix means that the complex conjugate uh, transpose is equal to the inverse of the matrix. And so you can use this to uh, construct a, uh, a series of these diagrams because uh, you know that u, u to the minus 1, of course, is equal to the identity matrix. And so you get a series of, of uh, there's more than one, but this is just the one uh, that we've picked here, that these are components of the CKM matrix and the complex conjugates are, of them, uh, when multiplied together, must add to give zero. And so each one of these pairs can be represented as a complex number. And that means that we can draw it on an argon diagram and we can get a triangle. Now or at least we will get a triangle, but we will only get a triangle if there is a complex phase. If there is zero complex phase, so if this delta were, were zero, then this wouldn't be a triangle, it would be just a flat line along the uh, uh, real axis, and there would be no complex numbers. So the um, way that you can look for CP violation in the B meson system is that you can measure, for example, this angle beta here, and if it's not zero, then you know you've got a triangle, and you know that you've got CP violation because you've got a complex phase. Now, the other thing that's different in the, with B mesons is because you don't have long and short-lived states. Instead, uh, what was used uh, for the first evidence of CP violation were asymmetric colliders. So here you take an electron which has got an energy of 8 GeV and you collide it into a positron that has an energy of 3.5 GeV. So the reason you want this asymmetry is so that the particles produced, uh, and you operate this at a particular resonance that produces lots of BB bar meson states, is then the Bs are boosted. And that allows you to do something called tagging. So what you do is you wait for, you've got these two B mesons here, B1 and B2. One of these decays in a particular way that allows you to identify it as a B0 bar. And because these two mesons are entangled, you then know, because again, the B meson, just like the k-on, can oscillate between B0 and B0 bar. If this is in the B0 state, then at this exact point here, the B0 bar, this, this meson is in the B0 bar state. It then decays at some time later, 
and then you uh, look for this particular type of decay where you have a J psi and a K short and that allows you to uh, measure the CP uh, uh, state of this uh, what was initially a B0 bar and by seeing uh, where it decays the distance between the tagging decay and where the second meson decayed that distance tells you the time of when it decayed and that's why you have to have the boost the distance it moves gives you the time of the decay and so that way you can extract uh, uh, this angle uh, beta from measuring these decays so there were two experiments uh, that were going after this uh, CP violation in the B system initially this was the uh, on the uh, this was the Bell experiment um, shown here with the two halves open when operating uh, these two halves of course would would come together um, and this is in Japan um, and the other experiment here the bar bar experiment was on the Stanford linear accelerator in California in the US and both of these experiments uh, measured CP violation in the B system and they basically looked for this tagged uh, uh, decay to the J psi and K short and that allowed them to measure the uh, CKM uh, matrix elements they needed in order to get this angle sine 2 beta and their combined result showed that this sine 2 beta was not zero and that meant that you did have a triangle it wasn't a straight line because you had an opening angle here that was not zero and in fact you got quite a large value for this uh, angle here so there was quite a large amount of CP violation going on compared to the uh, Kaon system where it was relatively small so this was further evidence that the standard model uh, accounting for CP violation as a complex phase in the CKM matrix was the valid explanation for how this CP violation came, up at, uh, came about. Now the results from Bell and Barbar firmly established that quark mixing was a source of CP violation, in fact was the predominant source of CP violation. However, if we go and look back at our CPT symmetry that comes from relativity, so it's a symmetry we really believe should be there and should be preserved, not broken at all, if we break CP symmetry, then we should also, we're also going to have to break the T symmetry, and T is the time reversal symmetry. In other words, if, you know, T if, if T symmetry is broken, then the laws of physics do not work the same in reverse as they do going forwards. And this is not the same as thermodynamic arguments involving entropy. This is something that is baked into the fundamental laws of physics. They do not operate if you reverse the arrow of time in exactly the same way as they do currently. So to look for T violation, we went back to the k system where we found the first evidence of this time reversal asymmetry. Now the first measurement of time reversal violation, T violation, um, was made using a low energy uh, reaction between a proton and an antiproton where it produces a k and an anti k -on. And what was measured was the rate, the difference between the rate of K0 decaying um, minus the rate of K0 bar decaying over the rate of K0 bar plus the rate, uh, uh, sorry, the rate of K0 plus the rate of K0 bar decaying through this uh, uh, electron pion decay. It was called the, the Ke3 decay because it was a kaon decaying to an electron and it was a three body uh, decay. And this process happens uh, through a Feynman diagram uh, that looks like uh, this if you're a K0 or this if you're a K0 bar. So you could measure this uh, uh, ratio and if T violation was not occurring, um, then of course these two rates here on the top would be equal to one another and would cancel out and you get this equal to zero if there was no T violation. So to do this, the first experiment that did it was an experiment called CP-LEAR. 
And this is a uh, brief, uh, uh, rather old uh, picture, because this was 1990s, uh, was when CP Lear uh, ran. So what they did was they had a hydrogen target in the center of their detector, and they had these low-energy 200 MeV antiprotons come into the detector. So it looked a little bit like a collider, but it was a very, very low-energy type uh, collider experiment. And the, the detectors around uh, the interaction point here um, then picked up the decay products, identified the particles, and could reconstruct the events. And so we can look at a photo of this, a sort of cross-section through it. And so here we have a cross-section through uh, the CP layer detector. And one of the things to note here is because it was low energy, it was a lot smaller than a typical collider, right? Uh, so this is quite a, a small uh, scale experiment, even though it looks like the sort of the giant LHC uh, collider experiments or even the, the large uh, uh, experiments on the, uh, LE, on the LEP accelerator at CERN. It's a lot smaller because the energy is a lot less. Now, the result that CP Lear measured for this uh, uh, time reversal asymmetry was this value here. Now, it's important to note that this is not um, observation of T violation. It's evidence for T violation because this is only a three sigma result. And in particle physics, the convention is if you only have three sigma, you claim evidence. Uh, you need uh, five sigma to claim observation. But this was the first time it was measured. 1998 was when it was published in Fizzlet B. Um, and the reference is here if you want to look it up. Um, this was superseded by measurements at the B factories that uh, went beyond this and established that time reversal was a real effect. In other words, the laws of physics at a fundamental level will not work the same if you the reverse the direction of time. And this has nothing to do with thermodynamics. It is a fundamental design in, baked into the laws of physics that they do not work the same in reverse as they do going forwards in time. And this is often, I think, one of the most forgotten or ignored results. And you will often see people talk about the arrow of time being due to thermodynamics. It's not. The arrow of time is part of the fundamental laws of physics. And we know that because we have seen time reversal asymmetry. Now, while CP Lear provided the first evidence of time reversal symmetry, it wasn't observation. However, their result was expanded upon by the B factories in the late 90s and early 2000s, where they came up with far more complex analyses which dealt with some of the problems that were actually in the, the CP Lear analysis, um, but I'm not going to go into those de very technical details um, of how they sort of accounted for a few possible uh, misinterpretations. But the end result of the CP Lear and the Barbar and uh, uh, Bell time reversal symmetry uh, papers was that T reversal, T violation was established. The laws of physics, or at least the weak interaction, does not work the same if you reverse the arrow of time. And this has nothing to do with thermodynamics. It is not an entropy argument. It is a fundamental way. Uh, it, it, it's a, how the fundamental laws of physics work. They are not symmetric under reversal of time. And this is perhaps the most forgotten result in all of physics because every time you hear people you know, wondering whether there's an arrow of time and they talk about thermodynamics, they completely forget that our fundamental, most fundamental laws that we know of have an arrow of time. There is T violation in there. So now we've established T violation, potentially the CP symmetry can be saved. In other words, it can be a perfect symmetry. And the most stringent tests we have on that are actually looking at the K-on system and looking for a mass difference between the K0 and K0 bar, which is particularly sensitive uh, experiment to do in the K-on system because of the oscillations between K0 and K0 bar. And we have put very stringent limits on this. And so far, of all the symmetries associated with CPT, the total CPT symmetry is the only one that 
as far as we know, is a perfect symmetry of nature. Thank you.